Hey, everybody. Just get things set up here and make sure that I've got the recording the way that we need it. Okay, looks like I've got it all set up. I accidentally did one of these for my calculus class a couple of weeks ago and thought it was recording the whole time and it wasn't. So just wanted to double check and make sure it was recording. Does anybody have any questions about anything before we start? Any general questions? I was wondering since with the decision tree you did, would you mind after we did each problem, if you referenced it to where in the book it was, would that be okay or? Oh, I was gonna do that anyways, yeah. So, and, oh, and for oh, everybody good, else, good. Uh, okay. I, I'm gonna be doing a decision tree to kind of give you some guidance to figure out exactly how to do okay. each problem going forward. So then let me share my screen with you guys and, uh, you sure just I do get with repetitiveness, so if I could know where to go to look it over, it helps. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. Can you guys see my screen okay? Maybe? Yes. Maybe? I okay. Can. <laughs> just want to make sure. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn off my camera to save on bandwidth here and put my computer and tablet mode here. If I can get the controls up, wrong controls. Okay. Sorry, I gotta kind of rearrange some stuff here. Uh oh. You guys still there? Anybody? Yes. Okay. I thought I somehow hit a button and my screen went totally blank. Okay. Okay, here we go. No, no, don't need any of that. Okay. Okay, so um, here's the exam review. We're gonna go through it in a minute, but before we do the review, um, I want to go over the decision tree that was mentioned a minute ago. Um, that'll kind of give you guys some guidance for how you can figure out how to approach specifically the word, the word problem. So um, we've got three word problems here. One of them is from chapter eight, one is from chapter nine, and one is uh, from back in chapter seven. And I want to give you a little bit of a guidance on how to kind of figure out which type of problem you're dealing with. So, uh, so I'm going to hopefully get some, sp oh, come on now. We'll give me some space to write this up here. Okay. So I'm going to give you guys a decision tree. And of course it's trying to snap back to where the other stuff is. So. And just once I've got something written, maybe it'll let me do this. Okay, let me write this nicely. It won't snap back. Okay. So basically, um, the idea is, again, you're going to have all these different word problems. How do you figure out which type of problem you're dealing with? Um, because you don't get any practice with this during the homeworks. So when you're doing the homework, you're in section 8.1, and all the problems look the same. And then you're in problem or section 9.2, and all the problems look the same. So uh, 
the first thing I want to look at is basically, so the question is what type of problem are we dealing with? And it's only gonna get worse um, after this exam, when we move to the next exam, uh, we're gonna learn even more different types of hypothesis tests. And so this decision tree uh, is going to grow. Okay, so I'm gonna actually add, normally I just do this to kind of differentiate between the um, confidence intervals and hypothesis test stuff, but I think I'm gonna try to add in, see how this goes, add in a third branch to do the chapter seven stuff as well. So uh, the chapter seven stuff were basically things having to do, that's where we introduced the normal distribution. So these were just problems related to the normal distribution. Uh, in chapter eight, we had confidence intervals. And then in chapter nine, we have hypothesis tests. Okay, so there are gonna be some keywords and, and just I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So if everybody would make sure you're muted, that'll help. Uh, so the different keywords that we're looking for, basically the way the problems are gonna be phrased will indicate what type of problem you're dealing with. If you're dealing with one of these problems involving the normal distribution from back in chapter seven, the question that I'll be asking about is, what is the probability of some particular event? So the question will start off with, if you wanna think of sort of keywords or a key phrase, key words. Uh, this will start with, a, or it maybe, maybe won't start with it, but the, the phrasing of the question will be, what is the probability of dot, 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 some event. Um, <clears throat> at that point, it'll, it may be asking what's the probability that, um, you know, the height of a randomly selected woman is between X number of inches and Y number of inches, something like that. Uh, what we need to do at this point is determine basically what is our sample size? So, if we're dealing with a sampling distribution, that was section 7.3. And in that case, the idea is the random variable, it isn't asking what is the probability of a single person falling or meeting some criteria. It would be, what is the probability that the average of this sample meets some criteria? So the division here is going to be basically, do we have a single individual or are, are we looking for a probability related to a sample? So a single individual or something related to the sample mean in this case. Uh, and so this was basically uh, when we do the single individual, this was section 7.1 and 7.2 kind of combined together. And the idea is in this case, we will be using a standard deviation um, of sigma. They'll give you mu, they'll give you sigma, uh, they'll give you all the information that you need and they'll ask some probability. And it's just a matter of going to table A2 um, and looking it up or using your calculator, or if you're one of the people that plans on using the spreadsheet, going back and, and uh, using the spreadsheet to do that. Um, if it's asking what is the probability of the sample mean, so basically the average age of our individuals being above a certain amount or something like that, this is section 7.3. And so in this case over here, the mean is gonna be um, some value mu of the population that they're gonna give you and the standard deviation will be sigma. Over here, the mean is still mu but the standard deviation is what we've been referring to as the standard error. It's gonna be sigma over the square root of n. And if you think about it, you can actually use this formula just in total generality, because over here, if you wanna think about it, when we're talking about a single individual, our sample size n is just going to be one anyways. So you can technically use this formula, even in these cases over here, uh, it just is a little bit messier 
because you need to recognize that the value of n is one when you're talking about a single individual. Um, so we'll come back and try to uh, do a little bit with that. And in fact, I'm gonna give myself room to breathe here. So let me move this over here, a little bit closer over here. And let me see if I can delete that so I can give, give myself a little bit more room. Okay, um, so that is sort of the chapter seven stuff. In chapter eight, we talked about confidence intervals. Um, and the, it, the keywords here that's gonna give you an indication is they will literally ask for the confidence interval in the problem. They will say, construct a 95% confidence interval. So it'll literally have the words confidence interval in it. Um, so basically, if you see the word confidence, there's a pretty good indication. There's a confidence level and they will ask for the confidence interval. Uh, so pretty much look for the keyword confidence. Uh, that's opposed to a hypothesis test where within a hypothesis test, they just ask a question. Um, we've seen a couple of examples uh, in the videos and you've probably done quite a few on the homeworks by now, but ultimately they're just asking a question. They have some evidence. It suggests that something is true and they'll ask the question is, does this seem true at a, at a certain significance level? And so the important word over here is gonna be a significance level. So they will always talk about, is it true at a given significance level of alpha? And so that's kind of the keyword that will indicate to you, they're just gonna be asking a question and they'll talk about, uh, is this true or not at a given significance level? Okay, so coming back to the confidence intervals. Confidence intervals break into um, basically two sort of subcategories from here. Hopefully I'll have room. So let me kind of do them like this. We have confidence intervals for the mean, and we also have confidence intervals for the population proportion. So mean or population proportion. Um, the keywords that will indicate which one you're looking at uh, or looking for. So if you want to think about having keywords at this level too, which I'll try to sneak in. Hopefully we'll have room here. The keywords will either be, they'll talk about the mean or maybe the average. These words will show up in the framing of the question versus in the case of a population proportion, uh, the keywords may be something like proportion or percentage. Proportion, maybe even portion uh, or percentage. What percentage of individuals fall into a certain category? Um, so those are kind of some of the keywords you can look for there. If you've determined that you're dealing with a confidence interval for a population proportion, that's enough to narrow it down to section 8.3. So uh, from the book, that's what we're looking at, section 8.3. If you're dealing with a mean, there were two different sections. Uh, and so this splits yet again. So this splits further into two categories. We had the mean where sigma was known and we had the mean where sigma was unknown. So really the difference is either we're gonna know sigma or we're gonna know S, the standard deviation of the sample. Um, so this is kind of the distinction. They're, in both cases, they're gonna talk about a standard deviation. Uh, and the question is, is that standard deviation the standard deviation of the entire population? That would be the case over here if we have sigma. Or based on just reading comprehension, is that standard deviation just the standard deviation of the sample that's given in the problem, in which case it's S. Um, so there's no magic keyword you can, you can use to figure this out. They're both going to have a standard deviation given. They're going to mention the standard deviation, but it's up to you and your reading comprehension skills 
to, based on the context of the wording, decide is that standard deviation of just the sample or is it of the entire population? Uh, so in this case, this is section 8.1, this was section 8.2. And the other thing that's important with all of these is knowing basically what distributions we're going to be using throughout the problem. Um, in section 8.1, this is where we're using a z-score for problems. Our, our, uh, the critical values is z-score, all of that. Whereas in 8.2, we have to use a t-distribution. So we use what I've been calling a t-score instead. And then when you come back up to uh, problems that involve population proportions, we're back to using a z-score again. So keep that in mind. The only time that we use a t distribution is basically when we're dealing with s. s and t go together. So if we're dealing with s for our standard deviation, we're going to be dealing with uh, a t-score. Everything else, pop population proportion problems or ones where the um, population standard deviation is known, those both involve z-scores. So there's a little bit of that picture. And now we can come over to hypothesis tests. And this one is gonna be pretty simple for now, because um, for now, all we have are hypothesis tests where we're asking about a mean but that's gonna change pretty soon. Uh, as soon as this test is done, we're gonna do hypothesis test for population proportion, and then we're gonna do a number of other ones. So this portion of the tree diagram, for, for example, on the final exam is gonna be more complicated. But for now, again, I'll just put the word mean here. Again, it has the same keywords you would expect over here. It's gonna be talking about a mean or an average for now, we don't need to worry about that. Um, but it splits into, again, two subcategories. Same as over here, we're either gonna know sigma or we're gonna know S, one or the other. One of the standard deviations will be given. We just need to know, is it for the whole population or is it just for the sample? And again, this comes down to reading comprehension skills. Um, if sigma is known, that's section 9.2, because you'll recall section 9.1 just introduced kind of the overall view of what a hypothesis test was and talked about the different types of um, errors that you can get in your conclusion, type one error, type two error, relating it to a criminal trial, all of that good stuff. And uh, if S is known instead of sigma, that was section 9.3. And again, this one we'll use z-scores and over here we'll use a t-distribution. So we'll use a t-score. One thing to keep in mind with all of this is in these two cases where we're dealing with a T distribution, you cannot use table A2. Table A2 is for a normal distribution only. You can use it for any of these other sections, uh, but for when you're dealing with a T, T distribution, the only table that's relevant is table A3. Uh, so just keep that in mind as well. And again, all of this will hopefully kind of come up uh, and we'll relate all of these ideas as we hit the actual problems on this practice test, on this review. Hey. Are there any questions about this? Hopefully this will help. Um, it might be something worth, if you're feeling like you're having trouble kind of figuring out which type of problem is which, this might even be something worth putting on your note card uh, is a little decision tree like this. I'm sorry, I had a question. Sure. Could you please repeat? I'm sorry, it cut out. I just heard, can I A3. Sorry. say that again? I'm sorry, it's, it's, I'm getting some weird feedback. Could you repeat again about the table A3? Oh. Sure. So basically, um, <clears throat> maybe I can even write that down here. So when we're dealing with uh, a t-score or a t-distribution, you cannot use table A2. Table A2 is only for a normal distribution. We can only use table A3 when we're dealing with a t-distribution. 
when we're dealing with a z-score or a normal distribution, that's table A2, but also it's the bottom row of table A3. So both tables uh, can be used in these problems that involve normal distributions, but only table A3 can be used if we're dealing with a T distribution. So same thing here, this can be used A2 or A3. This one can only be A3, A2 doesn't apply because A2 is, let me just write it in one place, this one's normal. And this one, table A3 is specifically meant for T distributions, but it also has at that bottom row labeled Z, uh, it has one row that's re related to normal distributions as well. So let me do this, this one's A2 or A3. And back here when we dealt with these ones, we hadn't even introduced table A3 yet. So these are A2 only. So hopefully that, again, kind of get it all in one big window here. So this is kind of the picture of which tables are relevant to which problems. And I will, by the way, prov I will be providing those tables um, on the exam. So you don't need to have your own copies. I will have that PDF available for you during the exam. Any other questions about this decision tree? I'd recommend now that you've kind of seen it, maybe go back and just try to, um, again, look at the review and make sure that it makes sense in the context of the problems that you're actually looking at. And then come back and use this on problems going forward as well. Um, it'll help on the final exam as well. You'll, you're likely to see lots of these same types of problems show up again on the final exam. So that's the good news. We at least get a lot more practice with these things. Okay, so we may come back to this decision tree when we actually get down to the word problems. Um, but in the meantime, Let's go through the actual problems here. And again, on the real exam, I'd probably recommend starting with the word problems and coming back to the multiple choice um, kind of at the end, uh, just be cognizant of the time restrictions. Again, I'm making this, you, you have two hours on this exam, but I'm really designing it to be a, an exam that I'd normally give in a hour and 15 minute class. So hopefully um, time isn't too much of a constraint for people. Um, but I'm going to just start here with the multiple choice. We'll just do that just to go in order for today. So I'm going to start with problem one here. Uh, <clears throat> it asks us to find the approximate critical value Z sub alpha over two needed to construct a 99.5% confidence interval. Um, one thing we need to look at is the fact that it's the critical value is Z sub alpha over two. So I know it, we're talking about a normal distribution here. Um, if I said critical value T sub alpha over two, and we're dealing with the T distribution, I wouldn't have enough information here. We would need additional information that also told us, um, for example, what the degrees of freedom was to be able to do this problem. So in this case, it's a normal distribution. We can figure this out. The first thing we should do is go to table A3 and check out and see if this confidence level shows up. Does it have a 99.5 confidence level? And I have table A3 somewhere over here. So here's table A3. Uh, and I'm going to go down to the bottom. And sure enough, in this case, this one's as easy as looking up from the table here. So the confidence level we were interested in is right here, 99.5. And the appropriate uh, critical value Z sub alpha over two is sitting right above it, 2.807. Um, so if I come back to the original problem, 2.807 is what I'm looking for. These are all rounded to two decimals. So 2.807 rounds to 2.81. So this one is A. Any questions on that one? And let's look at number two. Problem number two says, a hypothesis test for a population mean mu yields a test statistic of t equals 
0.279 and a p-value of p equals 0 0.089. Should we reject H0, the null hypothesis, at the alpha equals uh, 0 0.1 level of significance? So <clears throat> there's some extra numbers that we don't really need here. In this case, this is the number that we do not need. It doesn't matter what the test statistic is. Um, if what we're trying to do is decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis, uh, given this particular significance level, there are two ways to do this problem, right? We have the critical value approach and we have the p-value approach, but nothing here gives us the critical value. The critical value isn't given in this problem, so we can't do the critical value approach. That means we have to do the p-value approach because the p-value is given. And in the p-value method, all we need to compare is the p-value to the significance level alpha. So I just need to see which one is larger, which one is smaller. Uh, so in this case, p is equal to 0 0.089, and our significance level is 0 0.1. Should we reject the null hypothesis? Basically, is our result weird? And the answer is in this case, according to this definition of weird, right? So alpha is our, the way that we define weird, so to speak. This is our definition of weird. We're calling something weird if it happens less than 10% of the time based on this definition. How often does our outcome occur? Our outcome only occurs about 8.9% of the time by chance. It, would only, it only has a 8.9% chance of occurring just totally randomly. So is our result weird? Yes. And because our result is weird, it's only weird under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So in this case, we should reject the null hypothesis. We got a weird result under the assumption that the null hypothesis was true. Maybe a better explanation is that the null hypothesis isn't true and we should reject it. So in this case, the answer is A. Does that make sense? This tends to be kind of the hardest part of these problems for most people. And, and again, we'll do it when we actually do one of the problems, the word problems later. But I notice a lot of people are good at kind of going through the different steps, finding, computing the appropriate numbers, and then they get to the very end and people just kind of start guessing about whether or not they should reject the null hypothesis. All we're checking for is basically is P less than alpha. That's the question. If P is less than alpha, you should reject the null hypothesis. In this case, the reason that this is the criteria we use is because we're seeing is our result weird compared to whatever the definition of weird is. Alpha is the definition of weird is the probability of our result happening less than whatever the cutoff was that we considered weird. In this case, the answer is again, yes. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, again, please ask questions about that down the line if, if you have questions about that. Uh, problem number three, the point estimate and 99% confidence interval for a population proportion P are found to be P hat equals 0 0.583 dot, 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 and lower bound of 0.385, Three six three one comma zero point seven eight zero dot 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 respectively. Fill in the blanks. Um, so basically, it's just a question of can you translate into plain English what these numbers mean? And the idea is that uh, when we talk about a ninety nine percent confidence interval, it means that we want to be ninety nine percent confident that we're getting the answer correct. So in this case. The correct answer is we are 99% confident that the population, oh, and I said mean, I should have said proportion, that's a typo. That the population proportion is between basically these two values. So 0 0.385 dot, 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 and 0 0.78 dot, dot, dot. So this is another one where it is, again, A. Any questions on that one? Then we'll look at problem four here. 
uh, in this case, a test of a null hypothesis that mu is equal to 56 versus an alternate hypothesis that mu is less than 56. And again, I want to reiterate, I think I mentioned this in, in one of the videos, be really careful with the way that you write the null and alternate hypothesis. This thing that goes right here is a colon. It is not an equal sign. A lot of people on exams tend to just write something like this. They'll just write H0 equals 56. That is incorrect notation. H0 is just a label to tell us this is what we're calling the null hypothesis. H1 is a label for, hey, this is what we're calling the alternate hypothesis. So this is just a label. And then here is the actual mathematical statement that the mean is equal to 56 versus over here, the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is less than 56. Okay, so again, a test of the null hypothesis that mu is equal to 56 versus an alternate hypothesis that mu is less than 56 is performed, use, performed using a significance level of alpha equals 0 0.05. The p-value in this case is 0 0.174. If the true value of mu is indeed 56, does the conclusion result in a type one error, a type two error, or a correct decision? And so the question is, what, what is the conclusion that was actually made? It doesn't give us what conclusion. It doesn't say whether the null hypothesis was rejected or not. But we have to look at the p-value. And again, the p-value in this case is 0.174. And what that tells me is because our cutoff for weird is 0 0.05 and uh, the outcome that we saw was 0.174. So 17, the, the outcome that we saw had about a 17% chance of occurring. The cutoff for weird is a 5% chance of occurring. That means the result that we saw wasn't weird. And if we're getting a result that's not that weird, then that means our evidence isn't strong enough to reject the null hypothesis. So what we're gonna do is not reject the null hypothesis. That would be the appropriate conclusion here. So basically we don't reject H naught because P in this case is greater than alpha. So we don't reject it. And because we didn't reject it and it turned out to be true anyways. It turned out that the true value of mu was indeed 56. It looks like we made the correct decision in this case. So again, this one is A. Uh, and I'm not trying to do anything tricky here with giving you all A's. This just is how it worked out. I didn't actually look at these when I wrote these in order. So. Um, don't read into the fact that there's four A's in a row so far at all. Okay, uh, any questions on this one? This one is kind of one that's a little bit tricky because it requires you to kind of make this conclusion on your own without explicitly saying that this is what's going on. Okay, then problem five. A new organic pest control is being tested on potato plants to see whether it can reduce the level of potato beetle infestation. The mean number of beetles per untreated plant is five. It's hoped that the new formula may reduce this infestation rate. What are the appropriate null and alternate hypothesis? Well, right away I can rule out A and B because the null hypothesis, and this is what is kind of weird, the null hypothesis is always an equal sign. So we always have an equal sign for the null hypothesis. Uh, and so that narrows it down to C and D. Um, the alternate hypothesis that we're going to try to test isn't whether the mean number of beetles is changed when we apply this pest control. It's specifically wanting to know whether the number of beetles is reduced, whether it goes down, not whether it, it changes, but whether it goes down. And so that means in this case, the alternate hypothesis is we want to know if the average number of beetles is less than five after this pest control formula is used. So in this case, the correct answer is D. So again, just a couple of things to remember. The null hypothesis will always use an equal sign and the number in the null and alternate hypothesis is always gonna be the same number. 
So they should always be the same value in both places. Problem six, a garden supplier claims that its new variety of giant tomato produces fruit with a mean weight of 44 ounces. Uh, a test is made of null hypothesis that mu is equal to 44 ounces and an alternate hypothesis that mu is not equal to 44 ounces. The null hypothesis is not rejected. What is the appropriate conclusion? So we didn't reject this idea right here. The null hypothesis was not rejected. So we didn't have strong enough evidence to go on and accept the alternate hypothesis. What that means is it's not a guarantee that the fruit is equal, uh, the mean weight of the fruit is equal to 44 ounces, but it could be. We don't have strong enough evidence to suggest that it's not, right? So presumably in a test like this, there would have been some evidence that suggested maybe the average weight isn't 44 ounces. And we just found out that that evidence turned out to not be strong enough. So again, it's not it's not worth that we're saying that uh, mu is equal to 44 ounces, but we're definitely saying that it, it still could be. And so if we read through these and kind of see which one uses language that appropri appropriately kind of hedges the bets there, uh, we can't say that the new variety of tomato plant produces fruit with a mean weight of 44 ounces. We, we, don't, we can't say that definitively, uh, but we can say that the new variety of giant tomato plant may produce fruit with a mean weight of 44 ounces. The null hypothesis could still be true. Uh, and so in this case, it is A. Any questions on that one? Problem number seven here. In a survey of 447 registered voters, 157 of them wished to see Mayor Quimby lose his next election. The Quimby campaign claims that no more than 27% of registered voters wish to see, mixed up my gender pronouns here, him defeated. <coughs> Excuse me. Does the 98% confidence interval for the proportion, which is 0.299 up to 0 0.404 support this claim. So our options are no, yes, or basically can't determine the answer based on the information given. So what is what are they asking? They're saying they have a 98% confidence that the proportion of voters that wants to see Mayor Quimby lose the election is somewhere between about 29.9% and 40%. But they're claiming that no more than 27% of voters want to see him defeated. So uh, does this confidence interval support their claim? The answer is a resounding no. Confidence inter interval indicates that definitely more than 27, we're 98% sure in this case, that the proportion of people that want, want Mayor Quimby to lose the next election is between 30 and 40%, basically. That's definitely does not support the claim that no more than 27% of voters want to see them defeated. So A again. Problem eight. Uh, a 95% confidence interval for a sample size of N equals 36 has a margin of error of m equals 1.28. If everything else stayed the same, but we instead computed a 99% confidence interval, what will happen to the margin of error? So this is kind of the question of um, trying to think about kind of conceptually, what's, what does a confidence interval tell us? If we wanna be 95% sure that we hit a target, it turns out that we have to make a target with sort of a, a radius, so to speak, of 1.28. The size of our target has to be 1.28. If I wanna instead be 99% sure that I can hit the target, what do I need to do to the target? Well, I need to make the target bigger so it's easier to hit. So in this case, 
we would have to increase the value of M if we wanted to become 99% sure that we could hit that same target. So in this case, the value of M has to increase. We have to make the margin of error larger if we wanna be more confident that we're getting the answer right. Problem nine, very similar. A 95% confidence interval for a sample size of n equals 36 has a margin of error of m equals 1.28. So the same first sentence. But now it's saying is if all else stays the same, but we instead are able to take additional samples so that our sample size n goes up to 50, what would happen to the margin of error? And so again, this is sort of a conceptual question and it boils down to what is the effect of taking a larger sample? Is taking a larger sample a good thing? or a bad thing. And hopefully most people recognize intuitively that a bigger sample is better. A larger sample should allow you to zero in on the results more carefully. So in this case, we increase the sample size. That should allow me to decrease the margin of error. I should be able to zero in more closely on the correct value that we're looking for. So in this case, I would expect the value of M to decrease, to go down which is option C. You can also see that mathematically because the formula for the margin of error is going to be in general, depending on, again, whether we're doing uh, z-score or t-score, but let's just assume we're dealing with a normal distribution. Uh, it's the critical value times the standard error, which is gonna be sigma over the square root of M. We're questioning what happens to M if n, our sample size gets larger. So if n increases and we're increasing the denominator, what does that do to the overall number? Well, what's bigger, one half or one third? As I increase the denominator, the overall number gets smaller and smaller and smaller. This goes from 0.5 to 0.33 to 0.25. So same idea mathematically, even if we don't have the, um, if the common sense approach escapes us, we can look at it mathematically. If N gets larger, M, the overall number is gonna get smaller. If our denominator gets bigger, the overall number gets smaller. And so keep that in mind as well. That's another way to think about it. So let me just erase these, just so we have a little bit more room in case I need that space. Problem 10. Uh, in a survey of 302 registered voters, 167 of them wish to see Mayor Quimby lose his next election. Find a point estimate for the proportion of registered voters who wish to see Mayor Quimby defeated. So basically our point estimate, this is just our step one on our, on our confidence interval. And when we're looking for our population proportion, uh, this is just gonna be our p hat equals, uh, 167 over 302. So if we plug that into a calculator, I can get my pen to work here. Let me bring up the calculator. And again, you can do this on any calculator, but if I do 167 divided by 302, uh, I get 0.55298 dot, 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 pretty close to 0.553. So the answer in this case is D, 0.553. Any questions on that one? It's probably the easiest problem on there. So that is all of the multiple choices. Uh, I do just want to ask you guys, for the most part, people on the exams that they're submitting when they submit their work, um, they're doing it pretty in a pretty organized way. But for some people, they there's a handful of people that haven't really been writing the answers down. I would really appreciate, even if you have your work kind of all over the place, just writing down a list somewhere on there, it makes it much faster to grade where you literally just list off the letters. So you just do A, 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 D, 
a a dot dot dot. It makes it much faster for me to grade. So if you don't, I won't take off points, but if you can, it'll save me uh, a lot of searching around for answers on your paper. Okay. Any questions about any of the multiple choice so far? Is this pretty good? All right, and let's move on to problem 11. Okay, so problem 11 says, in a simple random sample of 78 registered voters, 56 said they voted in the last election. We well, want to construct a 96% confidence interval for the proportion of all registered voters that voted in the last election. And so as I encounter this word problem, I wish I could have them on the screen at the same time. I come up to my decision tree and I kind of try to think about which type of problem is this. And in this case, hopefully it was obvious this one is a, uh, a confidence interval because it explicitly asks for us to construct a 96% confidence interval. So the word is right there, confidence interval. We're doing a confidence interval. The next question is coming back up here. So we've narrowed it down to here. Are we looking for a mean or a population proportion? And again, if we go back down to it, we want to construct a 96% confidence interval for the proportion of all registered voters that voted in the last election. So there's our keyword, proportion. This is a problem from section 8.3. 8 .8 so we've used our table to narrow it down to this type of problem. Okay. So let's go ahead and actually do the problem. Uh, so the first step that we need to do is coming up with our point estimate. And so the point estimate for one of these proportion problems is just the sample proportion. We need to know what is the sample proportion. So, and I think this will work. It's basically just our X over N is the notation that we used uh, sort of generically for these problems, where X is the number of individuals of interest, in this case, that voted in the last election over the total sample size. So for us, it's simply 56 out of 78. And if we compute this as a decimal, so 56 out of 78 is about, uh, let's do three decimals. So I'll just call that 0.718-ish. Good enough, three decimals, I can live with that. And in part B, we need to find the critical value. And so I should mention, um, before we go too much further into this, I'm you can sorry, obviously do this whole problem on the graphing calculator. For those of you that have a graphing calculator, you can do this problem and get the answer to part E in like you know 15 seconds. And if you have a graphing calculator, that's great. And I would recommend doing that. But even if you don't have a graphing calculator, this kind of levels the playing field. I'm making you do all the intermediate steps along the way. So what we're calling part A here, this is normally our step one in our five step process to compute a confidence interval. Uh, part B, that's normally our step two. C is normally our step three. D is normally our step four. So you can still follow the same, uh, you're gonna need to follow the procedure as we out outlined it in the videos uh, and in the examples that I did. I'm going to make everybody show all the intermediate steps um, because it also indicates whether you actually understand what's going on as opposed to just, did you memorize how to type some stuff into a calculator? And can I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, would this be like how it was on the previous test since you're going over it? Sh should we know what to expect um, this with the critical value of the point estimate, you know, how, how you've done it in the past? I'm sorry, what, what do you... 
I'm, I, didn't, I, just, I didn't catch all of that. It kind of cut out again. Um, Sorry. Will this be how it is, has been in the past? So to make sure we know like the critical value and the standard of error, you said on past tests, it will be similar. So I, I was just wanting to make sure it was going to be the same this time. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. Basically, you can expect the question to look very similar to what we've got here. It's going to ask you to do all five parts if, if that's okay, what you're thank asking. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm not a math whiz like you, so I get overwhelmed. <laughs> no, no, no. That's good. That's a good question. But basically, you can expect the I'm format. I'm really good with science. <laughs> <laughs> you can expect the format on the real exam to be very close to the format on this exam. I'm going to ask all of these same types of questions um, again okay. because I don't want people to just be thank able to you. plug into a calculator. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the critical value. Uh, Based on the fact that we know that this is a confidence interval for a proportion, are we using a z-score or a t-score here? Well, all proportion problems use a z-score. So this is going to be a critical value is going to be z sub alpha over 2. The critical value is a z-score here. Um, if we try to, so normally what we can do is just go check table A3. It's the first thing we should do is check table A3 and see if a 96% confidence level shows up. And in this case, there is no 96% confidence level. Uh, we have 95 and we have 98, but we don't have 96. So this means we're gonna have to find this one the hard way, unfortunately, using table A2. Um, what I do wanna show though, is that if we look at these numbers here, we can at least ballpark what the 96% confidence level will yield. So the critical value for a 95% confidence level is 1.96. That number is probably seared into your brain at this point because uh, it's shown up so many times. And for 98%, which, uh, so 95 is a little bit lower than 96, 98 is a little bit higher than 96. For the 98% confidence level, it's 2.326. So 96 would be in between these two confidence levels and its corresponding z-score, its corresponding critical value should be between these two z-scores. So when we get our answer, it better be between 1.96 and 2.326. So just keep that in mind as a, sort of a sanity check when we, when we do this to, to get a sense of what, whether or not our answer is correct. So how do we do this part? So what does the critical value even mean? If we draw out our picture, and you kind of remember what this all looked like. So now we're looking for, again, the center of this curve is the true population proportion that we're trying to predict. P hat is one sample proportion that we happen to get. We happen to get 56 over 78, which was about 0.718. The idea is we don't know where this 0.718 falls. I don't know if the true proportion is less than 0.718, maybe 0.718 is over here and the true proportion of all people that voted is less than 71%. Alternatively, maybe 71.8% is a low estimate. Maybe our sample uh, got less than the true proportion of all registered voters. So I don't know where this falls, but if I wanna be 96% confident, I can be 96% confident that it falls somewhere somewhere in the middle 96% of the area. And the question is, if we're looking at the middle 96% of the area, what is the cutoff Z-score that cuts off that middle 96%? So this is the critical value that we're looking for. It's the Z-score that bounds the middle 96% of the area. So our goal is gonna to be to basically use this drawing along with table A2 over here to figure out what that uh, corresponding Z-score looks like. But we need to keep in mind that table A2, when they measure the area, they always measure all the way from the left tail. They aren't doing the middle area centered around the, the center of the graph. They're measuring the area from the left tail up to a given Z-score. So I can't just look up an area of 0.96, instead, if 96% of the area is in the middle in our drawing, how much does that leave over for the two tails? Well, that indicates that I have a leftover between the two tails of 0 0.04 split evenly between the two tails. 
And what that means is each tail would be half of that, which would be 0 0.02. So 0 0.02 in the left and 0 0.02 in the right. And so if I want this combined area that includes both the left tail and the middle portion, which is what we're trying to find to get this particular z-score, I need to combine this area along with the area in the tail, which was 0 0.02. So that combined area is 0 0.98. And that is the area, let me write that a little more clearly, 0 0.98. That is the area I need to do a reverse lookup in table uh, A2 to find. Um, you can also do this problem if, if you have a calculator doing the inverse norm uh, option on the calculator. I think I did an example of that in one of the videos way back when. But in this case, I'm just gonna use the table. But if you wanna use the calculator and you know how to do it for this type of problem, that is fine. So the idea is again, when you look at one of our tables, in this case, table A2, the Z scores are along the edge and all these numbers, these uh, four decimal long numbers in the middle, they represent the areas. And we're looking for an area of 0.98. So I want the number as close as possible to 0.98. You can see it's gonna be close down here somewhere as we go through it, 0 0.9783, 0 0.9788, 0 0.9793, 0 0.9798. And then right here, it jumps up to 0 0.9803. So these are the two numbers. Let me zoom in just so that you guys can all see this. It's very tiny otherwise. These are the two numbers that I'm looking at. Which one of these is closer to 0.98? This one is off by 0.0003. It's 0 0.003 more than 0.98. This one's off by 0.0002. It's 0 0.0002 less than 0.98. So this is actually the closer number. That's the one I'm going to use. And what is the corresponding z-score for that number? It is 2.05. So the corresponding z-score is 2.05. And that... is the critical value that we found. So this is doing it the hard way. Again, if you get lucky, we just go to table A3 and hope that the confidence level that's specified shows up as one of these values down here. But if it doesn't, we have to do it the hard way that we just did. Um, we can come back and check what I was mentioning earlier. Our result was 2.05. Is that indeed between 1.96 and 2.326? And the answer is yes. So this makes sense. 2.05 uh, definitely falls in the range that we were expecting. So we probably didn't screw up. Probably. Any questions on this? Would you be able to show it on the calculator for each of the problems? Because I was getting mixed up with the steps to type in on the calculator. Do you want to know just this one particular step on the calculator or just at the end, do the whole, like construct the confidence interval on the calculator? Um, like, can you do at the very end? Cause I remember through like watching the videos and stuff, I was getting mixed up with like how to type each one on the calculator. I was just getting confused with all the different buttons and options. Sure, let me do it. Let me do both. So real quickly, let me just show you how to use that inverse. We can find this number 2.05 on the calculator as well. Um, but you don't really need to, you can just use the table. Uh, it's not bad, but basically we're gonna go to our list of distributions. So again, hit second bars to get to the list of distributions. And we want this one inverse normal. We kind of use the table A2 in the reverse order in the inverse order of the way we normally use it. And that's kind of the hint that we want the inverse normal here. And we'll ask for the area. We need to enter this combined area 0.98. It asks for, uh, in this case, if we all we want is the z-score. Remember the means of z-scores are always zero. The standard deviations are always one. So I'm just gonna enter 0 0.98, zero, one, and hit paste, and then hit enter. And it should give me the number that we just found. Yeah, sure enough, 2.05374. So it gave us a more accurate one than what we had, but it matches uh, our table to at least those two decimals. 
So just as a heads up, if you do want to use the calculator for this intermediate step, that is also a possibility. But you still have to kind of go through the work of drawing this picture and figuring out exactly what the area is that you need to look up anyways. Um, and so if you looked up 0.96 instead, I would definitely take off points. So keep that in mind as well. If you didn't do the 0.98, if you only typed in the center area, you would lose some points here. Uh, but yes, I will also come back and do the whole problem on the calculator at the end to just verify that our answer is correct. So for now, let me minimize that and let's move on to part C here. So part C says for us to compute the standard error. And so we need to have the formulas for all of these things um, more or less memorized, or if you don't have them memorized, you've got to put them on uh, your note card. If you do, actually, if you guys don't mind, just a minute, my daughter is knocking at the door. Hold on just a second, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. So, uh, like I was saying, oh, the formulas. Um, have the formulas memorized, or again, if you don't have them memorized, um, maybe put them on your note card. Uh, and one good way to kind of do this that we can kind of, maybe this is worth doing here on the side. Sorry to kind of skip around so much. But if you want on your note card to try to condense all the different confidence interval problems into kind of one thing, what you can remember is that we really have the same five-step process for all the three different types of confidence intervals. And step one is always going to be find the point estimate. Step two is always going to be find the critical value. Uh, step three will always be the standard error. Step four will always be the margin of error. And step five will always be the full confidence interval. And if you think about what these things are, um, basically we had sort of three different sections. We had 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3. If you wanna kind of break these into almost a table here. Uh, and the point estimate, um, if we were doing 8.1, that was for a mean, it would just be X bar. 8.2 is also for a mean, but this time with sigma unknown. So it's also X bar. And in 8.3, it's P hat, it's the proportion. The critical values are Z scores in these two cases and a T score in section 8.2 in the middle case. Uh, the formulas for the standard error are either sigma over the square root of N S over the square root of n, or in the last case, it's the uh, formula that kind of looks like the one from the binomial distribution. If I can get this to write here, okay. P hat times one minus P hat divided by n, the whole thing square rooted. Uh, and that is the formula in that case. And then for these last ones, don't even need to think about formulas per se, it's really always, uh, for the margin of error, it's always step two times step three. And then for the confidence interval, it's always step one plus or minus step four. So if you wanted to try to condense basically all the confidence interval procedures down into one tiny little area on your note card, you could basically do a table that looks just like this. The procedure is the same for all of them. All that changes slightly is what the point estimate looks like, how, wh whether we're using a z-score or t-score for our critical value. And the main thing that changes is the formula for the standard error. So this would be a kind of condensed way to write all of those problems down in one little area. So for us, 
we're doing again a section 8.3 problem. So here is our formula for the standard error. And again, I would highly recommend writing down these values or these formulas rather in order to ensure that you can get some partial credit if you screw up the values. So that's what our uh, formula for our standard error is going to look like. We just need to plug in this number for p hat and our sample size n was 78. So for us, this is gonna look like the square root of, uh, I'm gonna just do the rounded version. So 0 0.718 times one minus 0.718, whole thing divided by 78. It's a lot of sevens and eights, unfortunately. And we're gonna just plug that into a calculator. So I'm gonna do the square root, let me get this thing on. So the square root button is the second option of this button right here. You can kind of see it right there. So do second square root. And I'm gonna just type it in basically as you see it here. 0.718 times the parentheses, it'll automatically know that you're doing times. So one minus 0.718, close my parentheses, hit the division symbol and divide by 78 and hit enter. And we get about 0 0.051 if we wanted to round that to three decimal places. So I'm gonna call that point. 051-ish. So again, that's just coming from the calculator, just typing in this formula onto the calculator. Now we're going to compute the margin of error. We'll come back to the calculator. And in fact, maybe I can keep it on screen. Let me try to do that. There we go. Uh, and let me close that. Don't need that open. Okay. Uh, What was I saying? Okay, sorry. Uh, margin of error. So margin of error, we just need to multiply the result of step two times the result of step three. So I need to multiply the 2.05 times the 0 0.051. So our margin of error in this case is again, step two times step three, or in this case, Z sub alpha over two times the square root of the P hat times one minus P hat divided by N, which again for us is gonna be about 2.05 times 0 0.051. We can do that over here. 2.05 times 0 0.051. And we get 0 0.10, again, rounding that to three decimals. I call that about 0 0.105-ish. So our margin of error is about 0 0.105. And that's what we need to construct our confidence interval. So our confidence interval is going to be p hat plus or minus the margin of error m that we just found, which for us will give me a lower bound, if we do it in our parentheses here, of step one, which was, try to get this all on the screen so we can see it all at once, 0 0.718 minus the margin of error that we just found. So I need point. 718 minus 0 0.105. And that gives me 0 0.613 for my lower bound. Whoa. Let's try that again. 0 0.613 for the lower bound. And for the upper bound, I need 0 0.718 plus 0 0.105 which is 0.823-ish. And so there is my confidence interval. Um, if we had to summarize what this tells us, like in plain English, summarize what this tells us, we are 96% confident that the true proportion of all registered voters that voted in the last election is between basically 61.3% and 82.3% of registered voters. To get this result on the calculator, um, which again, if you are using a graphing calculator, you can jump straight to this, but you're still gonna have to go back and show all the, the work in between. Uh, we can do this on the calculator as well. So on the calculator, let me zoom in here. 
on the calculator. We're going to hit the stat button. We're going to scroll over to the list of tests. Let me do that. And we are going to do, in this case, again, we're looking for something with the word proportion or prop in it because we're dealing with a proportion problem and we're dealing with a confidence interval. So I'm looking for something with prop and interval. And if we scroll down, here we go, a one prop Z int. We have one proportion that we're interested in and we're doing Z scores and it's an interval. So it's option A here. A one prop Z int. If it had been, uh, oh, you know what? In fact, uh, let me finish this, but then I'm gonna go back up and modify the decision tree and give you the calculator commands uh, for all those problems back up there as well. But let's finish this one first. Okay, so one prop Z int, and it's gonna ask for basically all the information that was given in the original problem. It asks for our X and our N. Those were the values that we plugged in to find our point estimate. So it was 56 out of a total of 78. And we want our confidence level to be not 0.95, but 0.96. And hit calculate, and we should get an answer very close to the one that we got. It gives us 0.61331 up to 0.82259. And our result based on the rounding that we did along the way is 0.613 up to 0.823. Uh, so you can see that, again, if we were to round both of these numbers to three decimals, we would have in fact gotten it correct uh, either way. So on the calculator, this leads to 0 0.61331 and up to 0 0.82259. So again, either answer, even if these did wind up being off in the third decimal, um, sometimes that happens as you may have noticed on the homework, both answers would be correct, um, but I'm making you go, go ahead and do all the steps anyways. So uh, you don't need the calculator to do this. You can just do it by hand the way that we did up to this point. Um, any questions on this problem? Um, when you use the point estimate to find the critical value, um, I kind of got lost there. So we don't use the point estimate to find the critical value. What we need to use is the confidence level. Oh, right. We need to use this number, the 96%. That's what determines this number here. So this 2.05 has nothing to do with the 0.718. It has to do with the, the 96%. So... If you want, let me go through it again real quickly here, but it's also in, um, we did this in a, the video, I think for well, one of these sections, maybe for section 8.1, I wanna say. It's been a while, I can't remember. But I did one kind of very similar. If you, if you wanna go back and watch that recording or if you wanna watch this recording again, once, once it's all done. But let's go to it real quickly. The idea is that when we wanna construct a, given percentage confidence level. So in this case, 96%. The idea is, and I explained it in, in more detail in previous videos, but we basically are just trying to find the Z score that cuts off the middle 96% in this case. So if we change this number to the middle, only 92%, if we wanted a 92% confidence level instead, we would look at what is the middle 92% and what is the Z score that cuts off that boundary. To find the z-score that cuts off that boundary, I need to use the tables that we used over on the, on the right side here, table A2. Uh, and I need to not know just how much is in the middle, but also how much is in the tails because the way that the tables work is they don't measure the middle, they measure from the left tail up to a given z-score. So to use these tables, table A2, I need to know an area from the left all the way up to a given point. And so that's why we had to figure out, okay, if there's 96% of the area in the middle, that must mean there's 4% of the area left over to be split evenly between the two tails. So half of it went over here, 0 0.02 over here, and half of that area went over here, 0 0.02 over here. 
And now when I look at this combined shaded area that starts in the tail and goes all the way up to this cutoff z-score that we're trying to find, now the area is these two numbers combined. It's 0 0.02 plus the 0 0.96. And that's where we got this number 0 0.98. Does that part make sense so far? Um, I think so. If I have any more questions, I'll look back to the other videos. Okay. And again, I, you know, I'm sure you're not alone. This is always um, a point of contention. So let me just finish explaining this. Once we have this 0.98, we need to use this table over here in reverse because the, the numbers in the middle are the areas or probabilities and the z-scores are along the edge. So we're doing sort of a reverse lookup in the table. So I just went through it to find, once I know knew the area I was interested in was 0.98. I just went and tried to find the area as close as possible to 0.98. And this turned out to be the one that was as close as possible. And the z-score that corresponded to that area was 2.05. So that's how we use the table sort of in reverse to get this number here. Was there another question? Yes. Um, on all, with, for critical value, um, for 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, will you be able to do the inverse norm for um, each of those for the you critical can, value? You can use the inverse norm whenever you have a normal distribution. If you're, if you're dealing with um, the T distribution in section 8.2, there's an inverse T function you can use on the calculator instead. But really, in all these problems, you should always start with table A3. The first thing you should do is check to see if the confidence level that's given is one of these ones where it's already pre-written for you, where they've already calculated it for you. If I just simply change this to a 95% confidence level instead of a 96, we wouldn't have had to do any of that work. I could have come and just looked at this number and said, okay, the answer is 1.96, done. And I wouldn't have had to draw any of this graph over here to try to figure out this area and then go use table A2 in reverse. I wouldn't have had to do any of that. Usually okay. finding the critical values really quick and straightforward. Usually it's gonna be one of these common values down here. And it's only if the, if the confidence level doesn't show up as one of these values that you have to do what we just did. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, let me go up to here before I forget to do this. I meant to do this back at the beginning. I listed all of these out. Let me actually write out the calculator command that goes with each one of these types of problems, how you would do them on the calculator, uh, just for people that need that, because I think a lot of people are using calculators. Um, so the stuff in chapter seven, you're just gonna be doing basically for both of these. These are both gonna be normal CDF problems. Um, so basically, it's under your list of distributions. Oh, let me turn the calculator on. Under the list of distributions, the second one is normal CDF. And you would use this for all the problems in this area. You, you might have to go back and review specifically how to use it, but that's the approach for any of these types of problems. For section 8.1, this is the case where we're dealing with a z-score. So we're doing a confidence interval for the mean with sigma known. That means we're dealing with a z-score. These are z-interval problems on the calculator. So again, if I hit, uh, in this case, a stat button and go over to my list of tests, z-interval is option seven. So this is a z-interval problem this one to get to it was the second VARS button, which is the list of distributions. Yeah, let me not write in capitals. And then you went to uh, normal CDF. The rest of these are gonna be under the test. So you hit the stat button, go to tests, and then Z interval. For this one, this is one where we're using a t-score. This is a t-interval problem. 
And this one, which is the one we just did, was a one prop Z int. And again, if you guys don't mind, just mute your mics unless you're asking a question. So there's no feedback. Uh, for these problems over here, the hypothesis tests, um, we're gonna be able to do those on a calculator as well. Uh, those are the ones that involve the word test. And so far we've only done two of them and there's gonna be a bunch more, but it's these ones up here at the top, Z test and T test so far. So Z test when we're dealing with a Z score, T test when we're dealing with the T score. So this one is a Z test. And this one is a T test. So on the calculator, that's what all of these results or approaches are on the calculator. So normal CVF for these problems, Z interval for this, T interval for this, one prop Z int for this, Z test for this, and T test for this. So again, for those of you using a calculator, hopefully that can help. Let's come down here and do problem 12 now. Okay, problem 12. The heights of American women follow a normal distribution with a mean of 65 inches and a standard deviation of three inches to make life easy here. Uh, <clears throat> what is the z-score of a woman who's 68 inches tall? So this one's pretty easy. If we just wanna know the z-score of a, somebody that's 68 inches tall, all we need to remember is that it's x minus mu over sigma. This is the formula for our z-score. So in this case, the value of interest X is 68 inches. Uh, the average height is 65 inches. And we're dividing that by the standard deviation, which is three inches. And if we want to toss parentheses around this, it can help on the calculator. Hopefully, I mean, this is one that probably some of you guys can even do in your head. 68 minus 65 is going to just be three. Three divided by three is a one. So this is just a z-score of one. Um, don't expect necessarily to have one that works out this simply or easily. Uh, it would be totally fair game for me to give you something where this winds up being a non-integer value where it has some decimals that we care about. In fact, I can guarantee you on the real exam, it's not gonna be a whole number like this. What is the z-score of the woman who was 59 inches tall? So in that case, it's the same formula. So it's gonna be now 59 minus 65 divided by three. And if we do 59 minus 65, that turns out to be negative six on top over three. And again, you can do the whole thing on the calculator if you want. You could just do 59 minus 65, parentheses closed, divided by three and not have to think about it. And it'll give us negative two, which is the same answer we get if we kind of do it piece by piece. So again, another whole number, but again, don't count on these being whole numbers um, on the actual exam. And here's the question. What is the probability that a randomly chosen woman has a height between 59 and 68 inches? And here's the hint. What is the probability? If we come back to our decision tree, That means we're dealing with one of these. What is the probability of whatever event? And so this is a chapter seven problem. We're just asking what's the probability of the particular event. And we need to decide whether we're asking about the probability of a single individual having a height between 59 and 68 inches, or uh, whether it's the, the average height of a group of individuals being between 59 and 68 inches tall. So we just need to go back and look, are we talking about one woman or are we asking about probability of a group of women? And in this case, it says, what is the probability that a randomly chosen woman? So a single woman, so only one woman. 
has a height between 59 and 68 inches. And so that is enough to narrow it down to right here, single individual. This is the problems that were from like 7.1 and 7.2. This is what we're dealing with over here. So, so this is like a seven point, I think we did the applications in 7.2, but we might've done some as simple as this. So this part down here is section 7.2-ish. So we need to figure out the probability that a randomly chosen woman has a height between 59 and 68 inches. It will help if we come down here and do part D first, that's gonna make us basically draw the picture of the area that we're trying to find. So I wanna draw a picture of the region associated with this probability that we're trying to compute. Uh, we're looking for something that looks like this. The center of our curve is always gonna be mu. This is the population mean. We know that the population mean according to this is, right, American women follow normal, the heights of American women follow normal distribution with a mean of 65. It tells us the value of mu. It tells us that this value right here is 65. And we found the z-scores of the women that we're interested in being plus one, so right, plus three inches. This distance right here is three inches. So the z-score here was one, that gave us 68 for this height. And if we go the other direction, it would be like two standard deviations to the left. That's where the 59 inches was. So basically this is kind of the picture that we're looking at. These were the core, so these were the x values. X is heights in inches, right? This is height. What are the corresponding z-scores? We already found that this was one and this was negative two. So there are the bounds. So in terms of heights, in terms of the, the uh, random variable X, it's 59 to 68 inches. In terms of Z scores, we're interested in the probability of falling between a Z score of negative two and positive one. This is the area that I want to find. So how do we find that area? We have a couple of ways of doing it. We can do it on the calculator and we can do it on uh, with the table. So let's do it with the table first. The tables, again, only give me the area to the left of a given z-score. If I want the area between two z-scores, I have to break it up. So in this case, we're going to be looking at basically uh, maybe I'll do this in colors. If I want the area of this whole larger region in red, and then I'm going to subtract off the area of this smaller region in blue, and that'll leave me with the leftover region that I care about. So we're going to do the red area minus the blue area to get the area in between that I shaded. That's our goal here. Hopefully, Nobody's colorblind. I apologize if you can't see the difference between these colors. Um, so on the table, if I wanted to, let's write this out. If I want the probability that the value of X is between 59 and 68, that's the same as the probability that the Z score is between negative two and one. And we can do this by doing the probability, basically that X is, sorry, not X. We're gonna do the probability that Z is less than one minus the probability that Z is less than negative two. This is our red region and this is the blue region corresponding to what we did down here. So I just need to find these two different areas and then take their difference. So if we come over to the tables, the first one I'm going to be interested in is z equals positive one. Let me, excuse me, let me erase this so we can see it a little better. Uh, but I just go to the table and I find a z score of one. Z equals 1.00. So it's right here. There's the area associated with z equals 1.00. The 
area is 0.8413. Does anybody have questions about where I'm getting this area associated with a z-score of 1.00? That is this number, 0 0.8413. The next one is going to be the area associated with a z-score. So to the left of z equals negative 2. So I'll come over here, negative 2.0, 0. And so there's the area that I'm interested in for z equals negative 2.00. 0. And that area is 0. 0.0228. So this area here is 0. 0.0228. And that is the difference that we're trying to find. We can do it on the calculator here. So 0.8413 minus 0 0.0228. And hit enter. And there's the area corresponding to the probability that we're interested in. So 0.8185-ish. Any questions on how we do that using the tables? We can also use this um, with the calculator as well, right? Do that right now. So okay. if you have a calculator, so again, this is, this is one of these things where um, the calculator makes some of these problems easier. We don't need the calculator for any of them, uh, but it is maybe a little bit easier. Uh, but I didn't want to force people to buy a calculator just to do like these handful of problems. So this is actually something, it's a good point that you brought up. I will be interested in getting some feedback. Maybe I'll send out a survey at the end of the semester of just saying, would you have preferred I just told everybody to buy a calculator at the beginning? Would that have made lives, would it have saved people enough anguish that it would have been worth paying the hundred dollars for a calculator? Uh, or is the way that we did things, did it work out well enough? So not a question for now, but I'll probably send out a survey on that because I don't want to make things harder. So, oh, sorry, it looks like I'm getting an Amber alert. Oh, no, COVID alert. Never mind. Sorry. You know it's bad when your phone's on silent and it's still buzzing. So, Okay, um, let me do the whole thing on the calculator here. So if we want to do this on the calculator, I said this was a normal CDF problem. So that's under the list of distributions. So I'm going to hit second VARS to get to my list of distributions. And we're going to do option number two, normal CDF. And this is pretty straightforward. I don't even need to find the Z scores to do it this way. I forced you to do them by hand anyway. So we could do this with either the Z scores or we could do it with the original values from the problem. You can do either. So I could do negative two for the lower bound, positive one for the upper bound, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This would be what it would be in terms of Z scores. So if I hit paste and hit enter, and sure enough, 0.818594 dot, 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 almost exactly what we got doing it with the tables. We can also do the exact same problem using normal CDF, using the original values over here instead. So I could have said the lower bound of the that I'm interested in is 59 inches up to a maximum of 68 inches where the average height was 65. Get this all on the page at once. The average, the mean was 65 and the standard deviation was three. So I can also do that. And it should give us to the decimal the exact same thing. And sure enough, there's the exact same answer that also agrees with what we got when we did it by hand. <clears throat> um, this is also the one type of problem that I showed people how to do on a spreadsheet. So even if you don't have a calculator, oh, I forgot to get Excel open here, but let me just open up Excel real quickly. Somewhere on here. And we can actually do this problem in Excel. So let's do it over here on the side. Uh, if I want to do this in Excel, I can find these two areas 
And so we're still gonna have to do the subtraction method. It's not gonna do the subtraction for us, but I can find these two areas separately. So if I wanna just call one area one and area two, and then we'll find the difference. The way that I would do this in Excel is with the command normal dist. So I'll start with an equal sign to tell it that I wanna do a formula and I'll start typing normal. And sure enough, we have this norm.dist. That's the one I'm gonna select. So let me do that. And it'll tell you what we need. We need X, uh, so the value of interest, the mean, the standard deviation, and in this case, whether or not we want it to be cumulative, which is always gonna be true because we always want that cumulative area under there. So I can do this with the original values. Let's say I wanted to find the area associated with the height of 68 inches. So I would do 68. The mean was 65, the standard deviation was three, comma, true. And when I hit enter, it should give me this 0.8413 number. So if we hit enter, sure enough, 0.841345. Do the same thing for the second version. And again, you can do this with the Z scores or we can just do it as I'm doing it here with the original values from the problem. So for the smaller area, I'll do equals norm.dist, parentheses. Again, the value I'm interested in now is 59 inches, where the mean was 65 and the standard deviation was three and true. So the only thing that changes is what we plug in for that first value. We plugged in 68, uh, the, the taller height up here, plugging in the lower height down here. This should give us the 0 0.022 answer. Sure enough, 0 0.02275 that would round to this. And if we want the overall answer, we just need to take the difference between these. And you can literally do it by clicking. You can do equals top one minus bottom one and hit enter. And we get 0.818595 dot, 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 dot. Uh, something very close to this. So if you use this number instead and got 0.8186, you would get just as much full credit as using the table and getting 0.8185. I'm not gonna, I, unlike the homework, I'm not gonna care uh, <clears throat> if you use the table or if you used a calculator or Excel. Any questions on this one? All right, then let's do the last problem. Let's get rid of that. I don't know if I'll need the calculator right away. Let me flip my computer back. Okay. So one thing is kind of by process of elimination, we can probably narrow down what type of th problem this one is. If we've already done a chapter seven problem and we've already done a chapter eight problem, Probably a good chance this is a chapter nine problem. And sure enough, that's what it is. So it says the mean weight of an American male is 190 pounds with a standard deviation of 27 pounds. A sample of 38 males from New Mexico is found to have an average weight of 182 pounds. Can we conclude that the average weight of a New Mexican male differs from the national average? Use a significance level of alpha equals 0 0.05 and the p-value method in this case to determine our answer. So essentially, this is a hypothesis test. I can tell that it's a hypothesis test because of, again, process of elimination, which won't always work. But uh, in this case, because it talks about a significance level, it's asking a question. Can we conclude that the weights of New Mexican males differ from the national average? And we're trying to answer that question based on a certain significance level of 0 0.05. So that's the clues that this is a hypothesis test. Uh, there is our keywords right there, significance level. Okay. So going through this, I'm trying to kind of guide us towards the correct approach. The question is, uh, do we know sigma or do we know S? And the answer isn't yes. This isn't meant to be a yes or no question. Do we know sigma or S? It's which one do we know? So basically, again, the question is, we're given a standard deviation. It's right here, 27 pounds. 
when we read this and it gives us the standard deviation of 27 pounds, is that sigma or is it S? Is it the population standard deviation? Is it the standard deviation of all American males? Or is it just the standard deviation of the 38 males in our sample? So which is it? Well, based on my reading comprehension, it looks like it is the mean weight of an American male is 190 with a standard deviation of 27 pounds. This 27 pounds is referring to the mean weight of an American male. So we're talking about all American males. This 27 pounds is sigma, all right? So we know sigma. And because we know sigma, what type of distribution does this call for? A normal distribution or a T distribution? We're going to use a normal distribution. So again, we basically, going back up to our table, we just ask the same questions that are, sorry, our decision tree. We just ask the same questions that help us narrow it down. Did we know sigma or S? We knew sigma. That means we're dealing with a Z-score, which is uh, we're dealing with a normal distribution here. So we've narrowed it down to section 9.2. This is a 9.2 problem. Write that here, section 9.2. Any questions about how we narrowed it down to this section? Um, so S would be the standard deviation of the sample? Exactly. If, if they rephrase the question and instead of saying, so if they just said this, the mean weight of an American male is 190 pounds, period. And then this part was not there. They said, a and then they said, a sample of 38 males from New Mexico is found to have an av average weight of 182 pounds with a standard deviation of 27 pounds. Then, based on that sentence, when the 27 pounds is referring to the standard deviation of our sample of 38 males from New Mexico, in that case, it would be S because it would be the standard deviation of the sample. Does that make sense? So if I moved where the, with the standard deviation of 27 pounds shows up from being in this first sentence, if I made it now be here at the end of the second sentence, it would change the context and we'd be talking about S instead of sigma. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on that? Does that make sense for the most part? So it, I wish there was a look for this special keyword, but it doesn't unfortunately work that way with these. You really just have to use kind of your reading comprehension skills. They're going to mention a standard deviation. It's up to you to figure out whether that standard deviation is referring to all American males or just the sample that was taken. So the full population or just the sample. So at that point, then it would be the T distribution? So yes, if it had been the case that I just erased, if it had turned out to be S, we would be using a T distribution for our calculation. So S and T always go together. If we have S, that's the only time we use T distributions. S and T always go together. Any other questions about this? Because this is, again, I think this is the hardest part of these problems is literally just narrowing down what type of problem you're actually dealing with. So I definitely want to get any clarifications. If there's any confusion still at all, let me know. Okay. And if a question comes up or you think of a question later on, don't feel or don't hesitate to, to ask it, even if we're, you know, at the end of the problem or something like that. Okay, so part B is basically the equivalent of our step one in our normal hypothesis test uh, procedure. So you'll notice on the homework, they never asked for all the steps that, I'm, that I did in my examples. Um, right? They would usually kind of skip around a little bit, but I'm gonna just highlight here, I'm gonna make you do all the five or six steps that show up in the problems um, that I did in examples in the videos and stuff. So in this case, we need to state our null and alternate hypothesis. H0 is our null hypothesis. H1 is our alternate hypothesis. One of them is, the first one is gonna be mu equals something, and the bottom one is mu 
question mark something. We don't know if it's greater than, less than, or not equal to. Uh, those are kind of blurry. I guess that's just how zoomed in I am here. So mu equals something and mu, we don't know what symbol goes after that. Whatever number goes here is gonna be the same number that goes down here. And then we need to figure out what symbol to put in here. So what is the appropriate number? What is our mu sub zero going to be? Well, if we look at these things and we think about the question that's being asked, the question is ultimately, is the average weight of a New Mexican male different from the national average? And the null hypothesis is typically associated with the answer to that question being no. That's why it's called the null hypothesis, right? The null and null is essentially another word for none or no. So no change or no difference, or there isn't uh, any discernible difference. So the null hypothesis is that the answer to this question is no. There is no difference between a New Mexican male and the national average. In which case, if the New Mexican males have the same as the national average, if there is no difference, what weight would they have? It would be 190, right? So the null hypothesis basically says, no, I don't think there's any difference between, the, between New Mexican males and American males in, in general. The average weight of both is gonna be 190. The alternate hypothesis is what uh, the evidence supports. In this case, the evidence shows that the weights differ. And here's the really important uh, word that we need right here, differs. We have evidence in our sample that the weight is actually less, but I'm not gonna put less than 190. I'd only put a less than symbol if that was the question that was being asked. Can we conclude that the average weight of a New Mexican male is less than the national average? But that's not what's asked. So it's not a less than symbol. What needs to go there? A not equal symbol because of the word differs. So the keyword there is differs. Does that make sense? I'll take your silences. Makes sense to me. Okay. So in this case, that means we're dealing with a two-tailed alternate hypothesis. And that's gonna dictate basically what our picture looks like. And I, again, we're gonna draw the picture down here. I'm gonna make you draw the picture in real life. And again, I got my symbols screwed up here. I put the wrong figure in here. Sorry, I wasn't very careful when I threw this practice test together. This should be mu, oops, mu. And this should be X bar because we're talking about averages, not population proportions. I just inserted the wrong figure accidentally. Okay, so, uh, the next part asks for the significance level alpha. So this is kind of the equivalent to what we normally do in step two. Our significance level is given in the problem. And this is always the easiest step in this case, alpha 0 0.05. Because we're doing the p-value method, step two is a cakewalk. It just asks for the significance level. This is how we're defining weird. So that's the answer to this question. It says, give the significance level alpha, we've given it. What does this number represent? This number is the cutoff for what we consider weird. We're saying anything that happens less than 5% of the time will be weird. And that's ultimately makes our hypothesis test, these hypothesis test problems just turn into a question of, you can almost think of them as like a weird test. You have some evidence. We are going to assume throughout the whole process that the average weight of New Mexican males is 190 pounds. And then we're gonna ask the question, would it be weird to get an average weight of 182 pounds from a sample of 38 males? if indeed the true average of all New Mexicans really was 190, right? We have some evidence that New Mexican males 
differ from 190? Is it strong evidence? And the things that could make our evidence strong would be either having a really large sample. So instead of if this was a sample of 38 individuals, if it said a sample of 3,800 individuals, that would be a lot stronger evidence. Uh, or alternatively, if this number was much, much different. So 190 versus 182 pounds, a difference of eight pounds, there's some evidence. But if instead the average was, uh, the US average was 190, and in our sample, we found the, the average weight of a New Mexican male to only be like 150 pounds or something like that, that would be, again, stronger evidence that there's a difference in New Mexican males versus the US as a whole. So these are the things that can affect the strength of our evidence. And the question is basically, when we try to bring it back to the idea of weird, is would it be weird for this evidence to have occurred by chance? That's how we determine how strong it is. Let's assume that New Mexican males weigh 190. How weird would it be? How unlikely would it be for a random sample of 38 males to have an average weight of 182 pounds under this assumption. Is it really weird or just a little weird or is it totally something that could happen very commonly? That is basically the, the gist of the hypothesis test. So here's what we're gonna define to be weird and in the subsequent steps we'll see whether our result that 182 pounds, whether it meets this definition, whether it is indeed weird. Okay, so uh, right now we just need to indicate where alpha is. So alpha is our, again, our significance level. It's going to be the weird regions of our graph. And because our graph is two-tailed, this alpha is split evenly, 50-50, between the two sides. So if it was right-tailed, all 0 0.05 of the area would be on this side. If it was left tailed, all 0 0.05 of the area would be over on the left tail. But in this case, because it's two tailed, we have to take that 0 0.05 and split it in half. 0 0.025 on the left, 0 0.025 on the right. We have alpha over two on the left and alpha over two on the right. That's why the notation that we have is Z sub alpha over two uh, whenever we have a two tailed hypothesis because it's literally half of the area. So basically what I'm saying is alpha equals 0 0.05, that area is split up 50-50 between the two tails. 0 0.025 on the right, 0 0.025 on the left. These are the weird regions. These areas are the, the weird areas, the unlikely things to occur out in the tails of our distribution. <clears throat> so I'm going to make this really clear. The only reason that it's showing up in both tails is because of the fact that this is a two-tailed alternate hypothesis. This picture will be different if you have a right-tailed or a left-tailed hypothesis. If it was right-tailed, we'd only have 0 0.05, so the area would be bigger because it, all the area would be over here just on the right. So hopefully that makes sense. I think we did more examples of ones, almost all the examples of the ones we did were right-tailed anyways. So this is hopefully a good indication of kind of what you do in a two-tailed case. So these are the regions we're gonna consider weird. And now the question is the 182, where does it fall on our distribution? If 182 is just a little bit below average, then maybe it's not that weird, but if it's way over here, way below average on this distribution, then we consider it weird, all right? So that's, the remaining question is, where's that 182 pounds going to fall? Is it going to fall close enough to the middle that it's not weird, or is it going to fall way out here in the tail where it is weird? Okay, so we'll come back to this picture and fill in the drawing a little bit more. Uh, but the next step is to compute the test statistic. And notice I'm only doing the p-value method here. Uh, and in all likelihood, that's probably what I'm gonna ask you to do on the exam as well. The p-value method is definitely the more common method. But if it helps you to kind of write some of the stuff corresponding to the critical value approach instead, you can absolutely do that. 
um, the critical value approach is instead of keeping track of these areas in the tail, we would keep track of the Z scores or T scores that cut off those regions. And in this case, it would be because a normal distribution, it would be the Z scores. We would find the negative Z sub alpha over two and the positive Z sub alpha over two and look at those scores and then find the test statistic, which is going to be the Z score of the 182 pounds that we've got here. So that's our next step. The test statistic is a, in this case, Z score. And it's simply the Z score of our 182 pounds. So it's going to be X minus mu over, if I can write this out, sigma over the square root of N. Hopefully that is kind of readable. Good enough. Okay, so this is basically our evidence. This is uh, the equivalent of normally our step three. But basically, this is the evidence. This is where we consider that evidence. So it's 182 minus 190. 182 was our evidence. We're subtracting off 190, which was the mean. And then we divide by the standard error, which is 27, because that's what sigma was over the square root of our sample size. Our sample size was 38. So I'll toss some parentheses around this and we would plug this into the calculator. So let's bring up the calculator. So I can just type it in exactly as we've got here, parentheses 182 minus 190 divided by, and I'm going to actually do extra parentheses around the denominator as well, just to make it easier to read. So let me just toss those in here. So divided by 27 over the square root of 38. And click over here to close those parentheses. Okay. Hit enter, and I get a z-score of negative 1.83-ish. Okay, so I'm rounding it to two decimals. That is my test statistic. It's over here on the left. It's definitely over here to the left. It's a negative z-score. It makes sense because 182 is below the one average of 190, right? This number is 190. The question is, where's the 182? We know it's pretty far to the left. I just don't know if it's quite far enough to be in this region or if it's over here. So that is. That is the question. I found the z-score, but I don't know the z-score of right here, the critical value to compare it to. So I don't know which side of this line it falls on. And if we're doing the p-value method, I don't actually compare z-scores. Instead, I compare areas. I know the area in this tail is 0 0.025, and I want to compare that to the area associated with this z-scores. And that's what the p-value is. When we find the p-value, it is the area that we're looking for. So I'm gonna come back and, and do the things where it says to indicate the position on the figure on the previous page. We aren't gonna know exactly where it goes until we actually find what the p-value is. So that's gonna to have to wait another step. So let's find the p-value in this case. Uh, the p-value, so just to remind you, the p-value value is the area to the extreme of the test stat. So in this case, it's gonna be the area to the left of this negative 1.83, but that's only the area on the left. That's not a fair comparison to our significance level of alpha, which was split across both tails. So what we're gonna to have to do is find the area to the left and then double it so that it's a fair comparison between um, our p-value and the value of alpha, which is also split between both tails. So let's find this area. The first way we're gonna find this area is just using the tables. And then uh, the second way that we can find this area will be on the calculator. We'll come do it on the calculator. So on the tables, we are looking for the area to the left of z equals negative 1.83. So I just need to go to the tables. And remember z equals negative 1.83 and find that area. So here is negative 1.8. 
Let's zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little better. There we go. Negative 1.83. So there's our second decimal of accuracy. Here's our first decimal of accuracy. There's the area, 0 0.0336. But keep in mind, that's only the area in the left tail. So the area to the left of z equals negative 1.83 is 0 0.0336. Double it to get the p-value. But we're only doubling it in the case of a two-tailed hypothesis. We don't normally double it when it's either all the areas on the right or all the areas on the left to begin with. To get the p-value of p equals two times 0 0.0336, which is gonna be what, like 0.67 something, 0 0.067-ish. All right, uh, 0 0.0336 times two. Yeah, 0 0.0672. So this is the p-value. If we come back to the picture, the idea is it turned out it wasn't quite all the way over there. This is closer to where, let me erase the one that turned out to be wrong. But it turns out our 182 pounds 182 pounds wound up being right there. And that this combined area over here was 0 0.0336. But it's not fair to compare this area that's only in the left tail to alpha, which is spread out between both tails. So we need to basically imagine that we're doubling this over to here as well at another 0 0.0336 to get the combined p-value which is the combined area, which is 0 0.0672. And now it's fair to compare this number here that's combined between both tails to this number here that's combined between both tails. Alternatively, you could just compare these two numbers by themselves, this number to just this number only in the left tail. But in general, that's not what we do. We compare the p-value to alpha itself. Does that make sense? So the reason for the doubling right here is just to get a picture where the area shows up on both sides. We wouldn't normally double the number that we found uh, if it was just a right-tailed hypothesis or just a left-tailed hypothesis. The only reason we're doubling it is because it's a two-tailed hypothesis and it's only fair to compare a p-value that basically shows up in both tails to a significance level that also shows up in both tails. Any questions on that? Is that clear? And we can also do this on the calculator as well, right? If you want to do it that way. Do that all the way at the end, absolutely. We'll do the whole thing on the calculator as well in just a minute. Okay. Okay, so, uh, in fact, yeah, let's do the calculator now, why not? So let me bring up the calculator again. Let me do this again so we can have them both on the screen at once. Okay, so if I wanna do this problem on the calculator, let me just clear this. We need to go to hit our stat button, go over to our list of tests. And remember this one was section 9.2. That is a Z test. So, Coming back down here, I'm gonna select Z test, which is that first option, hit enter. It'll ask me if I wanna use a list of raw data or just stats. For us, we already have all the stats computed, so we wanna use stats. And that is what I will give you on the real exam as well. I will not make you do one from a list of data. It'll be the actual stats. And we need to go through and fill out all of these values now. So the first one is mu zero. That is this number here. This is our mu zero. It's the number from the null hypothesis. So that's gonna be 190. 
the standard deviation sigma is given in the problem. It was the 27 pounds that we got. So that's going to be our 27. Uh, I'll come down for X bar. What was the actual sample um, mean of, or what was the mean of our sample? That was 182 pounds, 182. And what was our sample size? It was only 38 individuals, so 38. And now it asks for the form of the alternate hypothesis. It is, ours is two-tailed, right? The not equal sign, so it's already on that. But we could also do, if we come down here, we could have mu less than mu naught, uh, which would be the case where we're dealing with the left-tailed, or mu greater than mu naught, which would be right-tailed. But for us, it's already on the correct one right there. Uh, I'm going to hit calculate. And it spits out a bunch of stuff that should look familiar. It spits out our alternate hypothesis, which is mu that mu is not equal to 190. Mu is not equal to 190. It should spit out our test statistic, which is that the z-score is negative 1.826 dot, 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 dot. That's exactly what we got here. We rounded it to negative 1.83. And it gives us uh, the p-value. It will give us the actual p-value, 0 0.067. Ours was rounded 0 0.0672 based on rounding. Uh, the calculator gives us 0 0.06777, whatever. Very close to the same number. So it gives us the test statistic and it gives us the piece, uh, the p-value. Those are the two things that this will do. We still have to, regardless of the having the calculator or not, we still have to use the information it gives us to decide what to do with that information. We need to determine whether or not we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. So basically we need to decide if our result was weird or not. Was our result weird in this case? Well, we said something's weird if it happens less than 5% of the time. That's what the significance level tells us, a cutoff for what we consider weird. And our result turns out to occur uh, with a probability of 0 0.0672. Ours would occur by chance about 6.72% of the time. And so it turns out that while ours is pretty weird, it's not quite weird enough to meet the definition or cutoff definition for weird. It has to happen less than 5% of the time. Our result happens 6.72% of the time. So in this case, are we gonna reject the null hypothesis? Did we get a weird result? Our result is not weird. So we don't reject H naught. The other criteria, the mathematical criteria is because our p-value, which is equal to 0 0.067, whatever, 672 or 67, I guess you would round this one to 0.678 if we were using the calculator, is greater than our cutoff for weird, which was the value of alpha of 0 0.05. Because the probability of our outcome was greater than the probability we consider weird, our result is not weird. We're not gonna reject the null hypothesis. So this is the idea. We assume the null hypothesis is true and we go through all of this. And if assuming the null hypothesis is true leads to what we consider weird results, then what we say is, well, maybe a better explanation is for getting weird results, maybe this was a crappy assumption to make. And maybe we should reject the initial assumption that we made. That's the whole idea of a hypothesis test. We make this assumption, we assume that the center of our graph is at 190, right here. This is the assumption we make. And based on the idea of the evidence being 182, we look to see, based on the assumption that the center of the graph is at 190, would getting an average weight of 182 in our sample be considered weird or not? And it turns out in our case, not quite. It's not quite weird enough to be considered weird. And so we got a result that wasn't weird. If our result's not weird, then probably that assumption that we made is a fine assumption. Uh, there's, we don't, certainly don't have enough evidence to reject that assumption. So in plain English, what is our conclusion? We should not be mentioning anything about null hypothesis. No jargon should show up here. This should be a plain English sentence that your five-year-old 
nephew or niece could understand. Is our result weird? It wasn't weird. That means we don't have enough evidence. We have some evidence, but it's not strong enough to reject the idea that the average weight of a New Mexican male, so there's different ways to phrase this. There is insufficient evidence to suggest New Mexico male uh, males have different weight or different average weight than national average. Uh, we could say it may be true that New Mexico males have the same weight as the national average, um, but this is the phrasing that I prefer. I think this is the most informative language. We have some so, evidence that suggests that the, the weights differ, but we don't have strong enough evidence, it turns out. There's insufficient evidence can I ask a to question? suggest that they differ. Absolutely. Um, so having enough evidence, would that just be like a, like an even further number? Because that one is so close. Right. So you have to check, right? We said that the 182 wound up being right about here. But so maybe if it had been only like 172, maybe that would have been further to the left than it would have been in the weird region. And that would have been uh, enough enough evidence to say no? Right, that's or... one possibility. The other thing okay. is what determined exactly where this 182 fell was how big one standard deviation is, right? This is kind of the ballpark of what we normally consider the standard deviation. This is our sigma over square root of n distance. The other thing that can affect that is n. So if we took a larger sample of you know, 100 times bigger, if we, instead of 38 individuals, we took 3,800 individuals, well, then suddenly this denominator is a lot bigger. This overall number is a lot smaller. And maybe now 182 is, is way over here further to the left uh, relative to how big one standard deviation is. Right, we, we just measured the, the z-score here, the z-score right here. And it's all dependent on, basically, it's a measure of how many of these standard deviations to the side is it. And in this case, it was 1.83. But maybe if this 38 had been 3,800, if I, maybe I didn't delete that. Let's see if I still have that on the screen. Nope. So let's just say, hypothetically, 182 minus 190 divided by same thing. So the only thing that changed is we took a larger sample. 27 divided by the square root of now, instead of 38, let's have it be 380 instead. Or 3,800 is what I said before. So that's fine too. What would I get in that case? Well, now I get a way bigger z-score, negative 18. That's going to be so far to the left. Right, if this is how big roughly one standard deviation is, 18 standard deviations is like off the screen to the left. So now that would definitely be far enough left that we would definitely be in the tail region where it's con stuff is considered weird. So there's different ways to have it happen. We can either make the number itself, if you look at this formula, either just making this number, the 182, make it be a, a more extreme number, 172, Maybe that's enough to make this z-score be go way further out in the tail, or maybe just changing n is enough to make the z-score go way out further in the tail. So there's different things that kind of can affect how strong the evidence is, right? If you told me um, a sample of one person, you took one New Mexican male and found that they didn't weigh 190 pounds, is that strong evidence that the average weight of New Mexican males isn't 190 pounds? No, sampling one person is really weak evidence. Sampling 38, uh, we're starting to get close. Sampling 3,800 like we did up here, turns out that's a big enough sample that that's really strong evidence. So there's different things that can kind of affect the strength of the evidence. And we interpret that evidence in the form of a z-score. Does that help people? Does that make some sense? We've already gone 15 minutes over. I'm more than happy to stick around for just a couple more minutes to answer uh, other questions. 
but um, this is kind of more or less what you can expect. You can see uh, just a handful of problems. Um, uh, when will this video be up? Will it be up by tomorrow? Hopefully. Uh, they It's basically Zoom saves them to a cloud. And so whenever they're done rendering the video, I get an email. And, and in the past, it's usually been about an hour after um, after we wrap up the meeting. And so I'll post it as soon as, as they send me the email. Okay, great. I think that gets everything I got. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? So again, practice uh, these problems again on here. That'd be one strong recommendation. And if you're gonna, if there, if you want more problems to study, I would personally recommend going back and studying the problems that I did in the example videos from each of these sections. So go back to my lecture video on section 8.1 and on section 8.2 and 8.3 and 9.2 and 9.3 and go through the examples I did on the videos. That I think will be more helpful than going back and trying to just do random homework problems if you want additional stuff to study. Um, the then, problems are gonna be formatted we... similar to these. Should we also look at the video for 7.1, chapter seven as well? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, if you want more practice on these problems instead, go back and, and look at some of the examples from these sections as well. Okay. So, honestly, right, just thank you. pick and choose. Where, where do you think you're weak? If, as we went through these, if this problem 12 seemed really easy and you understood everything, then maybe you don't need to go back and study chapter seven anymore. Uh, same thing here. If, this seemed really easy, probably don't need to go back and look at section 8.3 again. So kind of pick and choose based on what seemed easy and what, what you still have um, questions about. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Then if there's no more questions, uh, let me just wish you all good luck on the exam. Um, I will post uh, the stuff for next week, um, all the lectures and stuff. I may just post all the remaining videos uh, instead of doing it week by week. So you can kind of choose how you wanna work stuff around your Thanksgiving breaks um, if you wanna kind of take off a little bit. Uh, so I may, I may wind up posting, we have four sections remaining, 9.4, and then 11.1, 2, and 3. I may post all of them next week and just give you two weeks for the homework on all of those sections. I haven't decided on this 100% yet, but that way you guys have a little flexibility uh, with Thanksgiving as well um, to kind of work around that for, for stuff. So otherwise, good luck on the exam. Uh, let me know if you have more questions in the meantime. And... Uh, Keep up the hard work. We've only got like three weeks left. So we're almost there, almost done. Cool. All right, well, thank you so much. You were a big help. Have a good night. You too. Yes, thank you. you guys at the Have a good night. final exam review, hopefully.